Welcome to this week's episode of The Chem Show. The Chem Show is in participation with Early College High School, Ms. Tangent's AP Chemistry Lab, and due in part to public funding and private donations. Today, we'll be looking at what happens to certain elements when they are exposed to sub-zero temperatures. In other words, we're going to find out what happens when things get really cold. Specifically, we'll be talking about three different elements, tin, argon, and neobidium. For a lesson with tin, we have to go all the way back to 1911, where Robert Falcon Scott began his Terra Nova expedition to become the first man to map out the geographical South Pole. Unfortunately for Scott, when he got to the South Pole, he found a Norwegian flag staked in the ground. It turns out that the explorer Mertsen had gotten there first. Scott was dejected, his crew demotivated, so they decided to go back home. On their return trip, Scott and his crew faced a variety of problems. Antarctica's weather was the worst in several seasons. They faced starvation, scurvy, dehydration, hypothermia, and gangrene. And, probably the worst of all, the fuel canisters they had brought along with them had broken open. See, Scott decided to use tin as a solder for his kerosene lamps. As you'll see, a little funny thing happens to tin when it's exposed to the cold. What happens exactly is called tin pest. At 56 degrees Fahrenheit, Tin transforms from its ductile beta formation to its weak and fragile alpha formation. You can see the obvious difference in this picture here. On the left, we have the strong beta formation, and on the right, the weak alpha formation. Imagine a crate of oranges where the first layer is put in a line, and then every subsequent layer from there is just lined up on top of the first layer. However, in another formation, the first layer might be put, and the, s the second, third, and fourth layers may put in between the first oranges. That would result in an entirely new atomic structure. So basically, what happened to Scott is that his kerosene lamps soldered with tin broke down because of this tin pest. In fact, there are many accounts of tin pests happening throughout history. For instance, in churches during the Middle Ages up to the 1800s, their pipe organs made out of tin would somehow become white and fragile and they'd lose all tone and sound. As we can determine it now, we know that was in fact tin pest. Another occurrence in history was Napoleon Bonaparte's invasion of Russia in 1812. During the French invasion of Russia, the temperatures easily dropped below 56 degrees, making the soldiers' buttons, which were made out of tin, drop. This left the soldiers without any clothes, forcing them to face the cold Russia winter unprotected. For our next lesson, we're going to shake up a little what you think you know about the noble gases. In 1962, Canadian-based chemist Neil Bartlett created the first noble gas compound. He actually made a xenon compound. Xenon reacted at room temperature. Scientists' next goal was to get krypton to react. At negative 240 Fahrenheit, krypton finally gave up and reacted with fluorine. Now, the next step was obviously argon. Just to reiterate myself, scientists got xenon to react in 1962 and krypton in 1963. However, their next goal, argon, took them 37 years to finally break down, and it wasn't easy. It took a frigid negative 445 Fahrenheit to get argon to finally collapse. And thus, here's another example of what happens when some elements are exposed to sub-zero temperatures. For our next lesson, we need some background information on both light and lasers. First of all, you need to know that light can be affected by elements. Sodium, for instance, can slow light down to 6 miles per second. Now, lasers. Lasers manipulate light in subtler ways. What lasers do is they amplify the light. They do this by controlling the electron jumps that occur between power levels. 
you'll also want to know a little about superconductivity. Superconductivity is a phenomenon of exactly zero electrical resistance. However, it only occurs below a certain temperature. In this video here, we have a piece of yttrium being cooled by liquid nitrogen and thus inducing a state of superconductivity. Now the incredible fact about neodymium is that when neodymium becomes a superconductor, it is incredibly accurate. In fact, the most precise les lasers use neodymium crystals. Neodymium enriched crystals are used primarily in the optics field. Optometrists use them because they are able to scope a cornea without frying the rest of the eye. Superconductivity is one of the most beautiful and wonderful phenomenons of the scientific world. And with that third lesson done, that wraps up today's episode of The Chem Show. Hope you had a good time, learned some new things, and enjoyed yourself. Thank you.